season one, episode one, the making of WandaVision. Uh, okay. Oh, cool. He got a beekeeper Lego. Okay. Just cool. did his shopping spree today at Walmart. So that was. He got a beekeeper Lego uh, for his WandaVision yes. diorama. Apparently so. Let me see what's going uh, you can have coming out of the sewers. I'm sure he will. <laughs> That's cool. Okay. <clears throat> Are we recording? We're recording. Okay. In a world of capes and lunatics, gods and monsters, and big budget blockbuster studios, there is a group who assembles androids, witches, and maybe a few agents. They are the people of Marvel Studios, and this is Nuff Said. <sighs> Avast me hearties, and welcome once again to Full Stream Ahead. I'm your host, Charlie, the Professor Esser, and with me as always is my skinny rich friend. It's Maz. Hey Maz, and tonight's episode is Assembled, or to be more specific, Marvel Studios Assembled, Season 1, Episode 1, The Making of WandaVision. Join Elizabeth Olsen, Paul Bentley, and more to go behind the scenes of the groundbreaking series, One WandaVision. Uh, Did you just call him Paul Bentley? Bet Bettany. I call him Paul <laughs> Bentley because he reminds me of the Jefferson's Neighbors. So. Gotcha. Fair enough. And that was probably Bettany too the whole time. And <laughs> it was Bettany all along. Stars uh, Asif Ali, Kristen Anderson Lopez, Christopher Beck, C Full Cast and Crew. Um, sorry. Asif Ali, Kristen Anderson Lopez, Christopher Beck, Paul Bettany, Balin D. Violets. Uh, Gavin Borders, Tara DiMarco, Kat Dennings, Ithamar Enriquez, uh, ooh, that's the commercial man, Kevin Feige as himself, Catherine Hahn, Jillian Hillard, Jet Klein, David Lengel, Mary Levanos, Robert Lopez, Elizabeth Olsen, Randall Park, Tiana Paris, David Payton, that was Herb, uh, Evan Peters, Jolene Purdy, Deborah Jo Rupp, we all remember her, Max Schaefer, Matt Shackman, Josh Stamberg, Jen Under, Jen Underall, Mark Worthington, John Favreau, Chris Hemsworth, Fred Malamed, Chris O'Dowd. Oh, I did. Why did I not notice Chris O'Dowd was in this? Um, Chris Hemsworth. Chris O'Dowd. No, but you uh, right, but you said two names before that, Chris. Oh yeah, Hem Chris Hemworth. Uh, yeah, archive footage. Ah. Uh. So he shows up in. Uh, uh, oh, that's right, because Chris O'Dowd was in the scene from Thor: The Dark World where Cat De Jennings broke in. So it was uh. archive footage. That's why Anthony Russo, Joe Russo, Aaron Taylor Johnson, and of course the infamous Joss Whedon. Uh, <laughs> Especially this week. Yeah, well, you know. Uh, Sean Risigliano uh, was our director of photography, and additional crew was Jim Velasco, hardest working person in show business, post production coordinator, and technical operations. All right. That is a mouthful of people. And uh, this was a mouthful of a show, to be honest. Um, oh, man. There's so much, uh, there's so much in this. Um, but uh, so f first off, what is your favorite? Uh, well, here, I'll go first. My one of the things I found the most fascinating was that they painted vision blue for the black and white sequences. And that they often use that in old sitcoms for lipstick and other mm -hmm. things where the shade needed to relate to the audience as red. I was like, oh, mm -hmm. that's fascinating. Well, yeah, I mean, that is one of the most fascinating things about this is that they really, and again, just to show the love and the care that they put into these things, how they get the feel. I was really disappointed we actually did not get, because we do know they did bring Dick Van Dyke on to consult on this. We did not get a scene with Dick Van Dyke. I was very disappointed. I was really hoping for that, but yeah. I guess they didn't want to take away from it. But um, 
Because again, I'm telling you, he would make a great Monaco Prince of Magic. He would be so perfect for that role. Um, they look at Monaco Prince of Magic, you're going to say, oh, wow, Dick Van Dyke, and I didn't even know it was him. Um, <laughs> but um, I do want to say, like, that is what's really fascinating. Just the fact that, you know, when you're shooting in black and white, it's not just a color swap. That you can shoot in black and white, but you have to shoot in a way that's going to read the colors to the black and white interpretation, which is a brilliant concept when you think about it and stuff you never think about. It's sort of like when they point out that, yeah, actually the Adams Family living room is pink, you know, because it would have looked weird if it was like all black and gray because it wouldn't have had the vibrancy of a well-lit sitcom black and gray. So it's, it's really fascinating the choices they made for that and then when we get to you know uh they're talking about the special effects and that were really practical effects for those 50s and 60s things because of course and as luck would have it the guy who was doing their special effects says oh no actually i studied under the people that did bewitch so yeah i know all about how to do how to do wire wire magic um in a sitcom you know how to hide the wire how to make it float through the air so that it looks like it's floating on a wire you know i mean just that kind of stuff that they they knew what they wanted and then they just found the people that could do it they found the best this is one of the things and this is where because it was said that this was kevin feige's baby right this is what i what i say about a producer and this is why producers are way more important than people think because people just think oh the producer they put up the money they put the, their name on it no and if that's the kind of producer that maybe some people have producers like that but on a really good show what you find is that that producer is the person who whose art form is the manipulation of other artists so when I wouldn't, about, again, I wouldn't call it manipulation. I would call it the plying. Well, yeah, well, that's what I mean. So it's essentially, so, and this goes to, you know. Um, Much uh, like a director directs the cast in how to, you know, bring to fruition his vision. Yeah. The same thing is done by the producer on a broader level on the people that are involved in the mechanization yeah. of the process. So, and the reason why I use manipulation is this idea that, you know, a musician manipulates sound, a writer manipulates words. A I just think that that word is fraught with connotation that a word enough. like line could do without yeah. carrying that sort of, you know. And, and, and to be fair, I, I, I sort of take that somewhat from uh, Alfred Hitchcock who very huh. famously said, you know, actors are the paint upon which I paint my, that I use upon my canvas. Right. Which was also kind of seen to be kind of diminutive of the actors that, you know, to Hitchcock's view, they were just paint, you know? No, but I mean, when I was in acting school and I, and, and I was working with a director that I trusted and that I uh, uh, admired, I would say to him, look, I am your utensil, you know? Mm -hmm use me to get your vision. And I understood that as an actor, that that was my responsibility. Um, and exactly. with which I can play, but you know, that's an important understanding to have. Yeah. And, but, and, the and, director gets out of the people working there is saying, yeah, we're all commonly aligned on this vision and I will bring all of myself to bear to make that happen. How do you get people motivated to do their best aimed in that direction? And that's what a producer, a good producer does. Exactly. It's, it's a, and, and it is, Finding the personalities that are going to mesh, finding people that are going to work well together, finding people that are going to build out this universe well, you know, I mean, for what it's worth, like I said, it is kind of surprising in its own way that for as much derogatory stuff as Joss Whedon gets for Age of Ultron as an artistic <laughs> piece, we have not gotten the... Justice League level accusations, or even the Buffy, or even the um, Buffy and Angel level accusations that we've gotten about Joss Whedon, which really shows how Feige really understood what he could do and what he couldn't do, and where Joss Whedon could be applied properly. I think that's the idea. It's like, how do you point this person in the right direction, give them people that he doesn't have to yell at? And even if he is a horrible person, at least 
get him to make you good art, you know? And that's the thing. It's like, how do you, how do you thread this needle? Yeah. And, you know, and he did it. He did it with Avengers. And I do, I think he actually did it with Age of Ultron. I think Age of Ultron gets a lot of flack it does not deserve. I was one of those people that hated that movie. I used to argue with my friends about it. One of my friends was a big fan of it. I was like, how could you like that movie? And then one day I just sat down and casually watched that movie. And this, the, the scene where they're fighting in the forest, the, 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 mm -hmm. the, 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 the paintings that he builds in between the fight scenes where everybody's like coming across and like the old X-Men cartoon where they're coming across the scene at each yeah. other, kind of like that. And I was like, my God, like, they gave us that, like a, like a live action version of that, you know, grotesquely uh, grand violence kind of thing. And I was like, man, I should be grateful for it. Why am I complaining about nitpicky things? Um, and, and after that, I really appreciated the hell out of that movie. Yeah. Uh, everything it's, visually in that movie is everything comic books and cartoons uh, that we wish we could see when we were kids. And they gave yeah. us that, and, and, and for that, I, I was supremely appreciative. I really loved that movie after that. And yeah. not to say, Ultron was a phenomenal villain. A oh, really, really well -acted. incredible villain. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, all in all, it's Ultron, you know, and that's the thing. I think that as the stories, and here's what I'll give you. I, I think that a lot, a lot of times these things will age better because they're going to have much more of a nostalgia quality to them. And we're going to see where other things led from it. You know, mm. it, you know, it is like, you know, you go back and you read, you know, some of the early fantastic four, some of the early Avengers, sometimes they seem a little corny and clunky, but you, then you, but you understand, but I do understand how this built out into this universe that evolved greater things from it, which is why I say, you know, I think that one of the best things that the Marvel Cinematic Universe is giving us is this idea that they are not killing their babies. They're saying, you're part of us, you know, you were, you were under our banner, like even Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., all this stuff. We may not talk about them right now. They may not be showing up in our stories, but I don't think, you know, I don't think we're going to get a Luke Cage that's not going to be acknowledging what happened in Luke Cage. I don't think we're going to get a cloak and dagger that doesn't acknowledge what happened in cloak and dagger because that is what the fans have understood. That is what is established. And there, I don't think there is an appetite to just throw it out, you yeah. know, because it's like, well, no, this was the story that got written. And so you have to live with the story that you wrote. And even if you don't like what they did, it's your job to write it better the next time. And I think that's what we get with the dark home in this, which is maybe they didn't like what agents of shield did with the dark home, but they don't have to discount agents of shield or, well, I don't know how closely runaway. I don't know if runaways ever actually made direct reference to it, except for using the dark home. I don't know if there was ever a captain America reference in it. Uh, in the same way that like, for example, um luke cage directly references the mcu all the time you know although weirdly enough never references the hulk in harlem but i always felt that was probably because that was a little too real aliens invade downtown yeah we can talk about that but mm. up here in harlem when the hulk came through that was a much more personal event maybe that's not that 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 would that would be like you know <laughs> selling 9 11 11 tchotchkes at at ground zero which they do but <laughs> for the tourists yeah it's a little weird but um <laughs> yeah you know but that was the thing but then again you also get the fact that as much as people will say incredible hulk isn't canon it gets referenced by the avengers repeatedly in fact to the point where mark ruffalo in the first avengers says yeah last time i was in new york i kind of broke harlem you nah. know Although, as people could point out, he didn't really break Harlem. It's like, you right. know, he, 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 he accelerated urban renewal. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, um, right. you know, there's always so much he could do. But, uh, and for what it's worth, you know, the Hulk actually was relatively light on property damage. And mostly he smashed up cop cars, which is, you know, fair enough. Um, which, you know, hey, maybe that's not even a bad thing. <laughs> but um, getting back to assembled so we get this whole idea of how they're stringing the story together and how how they 
they really brought this this team of unique individuals specialists in their field together to do this and we actually get the fact that you know all of the musical cues which is by the couple that wrote the hits in frozen which is like you know talk about your that is like musically disney royalty you're mm-hmm. literally getting the people the biggest acts in um in uh in disney to come do this tv show and didn't the 90s version get written by i forget who the artist was uh the punk rock version uh, oh yeah 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 um oh i forget her name but um yeah the the original right they called her the original riot girl and i don't remember what her right. name was yeah yeah but, um, <laughs> um but yeah i mean that i mean yeah you you know they got they got a great you know they they really pulled in although i i liked the fact that um as they said the uh uh what's his name um cuz i just mentioned him a few minutes ago but uh it was uh, Chris, i think it was christopher and um kristen are the yeah uh, kristen and anderson lopez uh was it kristen anderson lopez and and uh, was it Christopher Beck? I, I can't quite remember, but that basically they like one of them was actually Matt Shakeman's old uh, college roommate, and then you also got just Matt Shakeman's um, you know history as yeah he actually was a sitcom kid, right? You know, not dissimilar to what Elizabeth Olsen grew up with, just going with her sisters to set, you know. So it is interesting that you know that you do have this. You know, child star royalty that didn't that are on the Ron Howard side of child star royalty. You know what I mean? Yeah. That that is that you know that that's the that's the dream. That is again where Disney and Feige are bringing together the pieces that work well, that make this a viable product. Um, yeah, you definitely got the sense that they were having a lot of fun. It reminded me of you know uh drama club in college you know you'd get to do like these little offbeat kind of things and the fact that they were there in front of a live audience uh looked like it made it really a good time for them as well because paul bettany you know at first he's like man i haven't been in front of a live audience in you know a hundred and whatever years since 1887 But, (laughs) but then you see him at the end of like the cast he's just like really like in the moment taking bows enjoying being in front of the audience and that sort of uh, a feeling of camaraderie between a cast on a live set is something very different that you i don't think you get a chance to get and for them to be able yeah. to find that old you know uh student actor version of themselves in this moment was was really really fun to see oh yeah and that and but again that is that that is the thing about like these the, the Marvel connected universe that it is it is this little clubhouse yeah of actors and writers and directors and they all get to you know they they're all on the lot and they all work together and they all are putting on the, the they're, they're putting on this semester's big you know what's the right, semester right. show you know we really doing- felt that way and my favorite thing i think my favorite tiny little 2 second scene in this entire thing was Catherine Hahn is up on 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 the uh, the pulley system and she's like no 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 one more one more let me do one more take yeah. that sort of feeling oh that that was that was so exactly. uh, wonderful because to see that made me smile really really big yeah and you see them you know and like when they're doing the Agatha all along cuts and you actually see her like like the outtakes where she just totally yeah. goes out and she like throws yeah. the dog <laughs> and it's just because it's like have fun yeah. let's see what we can create that's organic and real and that is not just you know make your 9-11 face you know that is not just (laughs) pushing people into these holes it's like finding the artists that can that can make them that can make their own art and that will make good art next to the art that you're making and that i think is you know that's that's the that you know and it's kind of funny because it's it's one of these things where Kevin Feige is central to Marvel's success, but not because Kevin Feige is making it a success. Because Kevin, it is because Kevin Feige knows how to bring artists together to let them make a success. So that even when they have an off episode, an off day, 
he's not like you're ruined you're ruined you're dead in this town you know right. he is right. saying oh, okay you know great so eh, it didn't make as much as we wanted to do but we told sto- we told a story and we're going to bring it back later don't worry right. and we're you still know. all aimed in the right direction i guess his exactly. strength and is finding people that are all aiming in the right direction so wherever they go even if they falter this way or that way we're still all aiming in the right direction and that's what makes it great that's what makes yeah. it a good show and you know at the end of the day that's always what we want is a good show we want to come away from these thinking i enjoyed it i was a part of this you know and that is again what they even make this point is like yeah you know we 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 put things in here because we know we know how our fans are we know how our fans love to go through these things love to look for easter eggs love to wonder why this is and why that is and really, they, they said, yeah, we, we wrote this to have that. You know, maybe not Mephisto every week. <laughs> maybe not, you know, yeah. maybe not as far as we took it. <laughs> Although I was, you know, it was a very good analysis of it as to why Evan Peters was recast as Quicksilver. And I still don't terribly understand the reasoning behind it. it so if it was just a goof, it's like, man, really? Well, That's a... That's a big leap to make for a goof. The idea was they wanted to do a recasting of Quicksilver. I know, but like... And they, well, no, no, let me... I, I can actually... It actually made sense when they explained it to me. Okay. Uh, essentially, by casting Evan Peters, we as the audience would immediately understand that this recasting was Quicksilver. Like, if they had cast some other guy with white hair we would be like, well, clearly that's not Quicksilver. I mean, for a hot second until she said, that's my brother. And then everything would have been the same. I mean, like, it seems like such a... (laughs) Well, because what it... Well, it puts... A reaching step to take for something they could have accomplished with maybe a half a second of extra exposition. Well, well, no, but you want to show, don't tell. Always remember that. I know, and, but I mean, but, 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 I said, but, but that rule is, is minuscule compared to the rule they break in this is like managing expectations, putting so much on well, there and not having it deliver. Like that has to be way outbalanced by, by, you know, the idea of show, don't tell. It's like, I think. Well, okay. Let me, let me put it to you this way. Would you have shared Wanda's confusion about it? Yes. If they had cast anyone else? Yes, if because it's not the person else, we know. It's not the person that we know that she knows. I know, but except, except. It's not, it's not the idea that it's a confusion of, I don't think this is my brother. It is a confusion of, I think this is my brother, but part of me isn't sure. And the idea was, you know, if we cast Evan Peters in this, everyone knows Evan Peters played Quicksilver. So everyone's going to be looking at this and going, could this be Quicksilver? And, and yes, obviously, and again, like I said, you know, this wasn't supposed to be the first one. So I think they were thinking, oh, yeah, by this time, we've had a lot of crazy things. And this is really our craziest show. So Fair this enough. is, you know, the, 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 you know, I think that it's, just, it's, it's, it's hard to reconcile. I understand that with everything so meticulously done with everything else about the show, this decision seems rather haphazard. And there must be a logical reason for it. Yeah. But I mean, well, like I said, I think the logical reason was to communicate to us. Yeah, I, I just uh, it was meant to it was meant to confuse us. It was meant to make us think this really could be real. I still don't that, think I, I think understand was what, it was what the motivation was. That doesn't seem like a strong enough motivation for somebody to do something that outlandish. Um, well, I feel because, like there's a, a deeper understanding that I, I'm not seeing. Yeah. Well, so here's what it comes down to. From the perspective of the show story mm-hmm. of why is Ralph Boner made, made uh, Quicksilver, it does not... It, Ralph Boner in and of himself wouldn't convince us that it was Quicksilver, that it was really uh, Peter Maximoff. Right, but I, I but, think it would have done just an adequate enough a job as this did if they, she would have said, it's my brother, and be like, whoa, it's not your Well, buddy. no, but she doesn't say it's my brother. She He's, he says, well, she does later. And, and that it's, moment, it's like interesting. They, that's how they end it. Because uh, who is no, it? She, no, he oh, says. In the next episode, they come yeah, back and say, it's my says, brother. He says, what, can't a brother hug his stinking sister? 
you know and then of course you know when you get his dialogue where it's like you know oh i'm uh <laughs> i'm just here to give you grief because of course yeah. grief it's all about grief and what is grief but love persisting yes it was grief all along what, what, what was, can, can, uh, i'm so what exactly did that statement mean oh what is grief but love persevering well it means that the love you have mm. doesn't end just because the person ended ah uh, i see you I lost see. them gotcha. but that love continues but it becomes like um and it's not a good way to describe it in electricity terms but it's like you know where you're sending this out there but it's not echoing back so it's like it's you shouting out your love because like normally you send out love and you receive that love back from this it's a, it's and like then, the voyager probe right it's out there and it'll keep going it'll keep going even after we can't hear it anymore it will keep going yeah and that's it'll 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 persist it'll persist shouting out to us just as love continues to shout out once that person can no longer send back the message of acknowledgement right and we get into that loop of please respond please respond please respond you know and man that oh wow oh that's making me tear up right now just the idea of the please respond please respond you know and then there is no response coming and that is that is love persisting mm. oh it's beautiful what are you gonna do um and you know this is this is again that humanity that character of what wandavision gave us you know um you know it's technically beautiful it's you know it, it was small scale sure although they do of course get to their big wizard fight at the end or which fight you know um and and then of course you know your ship of theseus thing and that whole thing we, we've, we've talked about all that but what makes it what makes it important is that like um not sure said at the end of uh, idiocracy that someday there will be um films where you know whose ass is uh, is farting and why I, I think that or whose balls are getting punched and you know that that is the achievement that it doesn't it, like, we all love to see the the the, the, the big thing but we want to know why and we want to know the feeling behind it you know and i think that's the 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 beauty of marvel is they're gonna give us space laser beams because hey it's a movie we need a space laser beam we need a big thing going up into the sky because that's that's what that's the that's the conceit of the movie but they tell us why the space laser beam is going up and why you know why the wizards are fighting it's not enough for just two people to punch we want to know why they're punching and then why they stop punching and it can't because they happen to have the same same name parent you know it's you know there should be yep. a reason <coughs> and for what it's worth marvel seems to always give us a reason and i like that yeah oh man so uh it was a, i mean it was a great way i love this assemble thing i hope we're gonna get one for falcon winter soldier which i think that's gonna, the plan that between yeah. the week or so that we'll have between new shows premiering and old uh, and current ones uh ending oh yeah that they'll fill the week in between with these and i'm sure we'll get one when they release black widow too oh yeah that'd be cool so they'll do a black widow assembled and then they'll do um a loki assembled or an eternals assembled whichever one is the next thing to come you know and then somebody will eventually watch these in chronological order and be like, yeah oh, well you know okay yeah, well, and then you figure out how all the pieces fit together, you know? Another game to play. Yeah, of course. Well, that's the thing is there always going to be these, there's all these pieces moving. And for what it's worth, and this was actually my favorite line from Kevin Feige recently, where, you know, someone was asking about, you know, Chris Evans returning as Steve Rogers. And he basically said, well, I don't have any plans for that right now, but I don't know everything which I think is one of these beautiful statements about the guy who is arguably in charge of everything, but for him to just say, no, I don't know everything. You know, I don't know, you know, I don't know exactly where we're going in 10 years, 
And, you know, there are other people involved in this. There are writers that are going to pitch me. Here's how I want to bring Captain America back. And there's a lawyer that says, here's how you're going to get Chris Evans back. And there is an agent and all these people that are going to work together to actually achieve these things. But until you have someone to first pitch the idea, have them like the idea, and have... Chris Evans liked the idea to come back, however it's going to be, that's when you get to move forward. Right. You know, and that's the idea is like, you know, you don't just get to, you know, because again, it's about, again, it's about respecting who you have in the, in the field about respecting your artists. Cause they're all artists from the guy who says, no, I know how to do wire effects, of course. And the makeup artist who says, no, you know what? You want to paint him blue because that's how that's going to read in black and white. And the people who know their craft so well that you can just say, okay, well, you tell me how to do it. You know, this is what we want to do. How do we do it? And they bring it all in. And, you know, how, how do you do sitcom acting? Which is such a beautiful question because it's the kind of, it's the kind of question a lesser production would never ask that is there a different way that you act in this kind of a, a, a style of, of acting? It's like, yes, of course there is. Of course there is. It's the same. It's the difference between, you know, opera and musical theater. It's completely different styles of acting. It doesn't mean that both aren't beautiful and artistic, but you can't, you know, it's very, <laughs> it's hard to go from one to the other or to be more specific. It's not hard, but you have to be good you have to be a master of the craft to move between things, you know? It's what they always say, you know, like, you know, Picasso, he could paint beautifully, real, you know, realistic paintings, but, you know, anyone, well, not anyone, but lots of people did realistic paintings. He, he needed to express himself in a different way. And he needed to show that, you know, it's not about painting in the cubist fashion, just because I can't paint anything else. It's about, no, I already mastered this. Now, how can I expand the art form? And the idea that you can do, you know, you can do sitcom acting, that it's not, it's not just the same thing as doing Broadway acting or doing, you know, theater acting or doing movie acting, that these are all very unique skills. And, you know, if you don't know how to do it, you're not going to do it, you know? And that they have enough respect for the art that they're going to be creating to send their people in and say, no, we need you to learn how to do this. Make sure that you know it because it's as important for you to be able to deliver a comedy line in a, you know, three camera format as it is for you to have abs of steel, you know? So every all of these pieces, we're going to have someone to help you get there because we respect what we're trying to create enough to not say, oh, yeah, you know, go to the gym, get in shape, do it. You know, go watch some sitcoms, you know, follow up. It's like, no, read the comics, learn what who these characters are because we want you to embody them when you go up on screen. And, you know, one of my favorite bits in this is Elizabeth Olsen saying, you know, when she first did this, they said, don't, you know, read the comics, but don't worry, we're not going to put you in the leotard, we're not going to put you in that. But then she's like, but you know, when I got to wear it, that gave me so much joy that I got to be the comics accurate, you know, at least somewhat comics accurate Scarlet Witch that, you know, it made her so happy to do that, you know. And then, you know, when they actually reveal the final Scarlet Witch outfit <coughs> with the wimple and you know the wimple as a part of being the scarlet witch it was yeah. really such a beautiful yeah that's the thing she wears that's what the, apparently that's what that's called is a wimple gotcha. is the thing um usually you wear it with something else but i guess you know just having that thing is the wimple part and then they just don't put the yeah i don't the know veil, sort of like a nun kind of thing exactly yeah, so that, that part that goes here is the wimple, and then ah. you will often have something else that goes over it, but right. just to have the thing that pulls the hair back is the wimple. Huh, interesting. 
if I recall correctly, and I could have just been using Wimple completely wrong. And then we said, that's not what a Wimple is. A Wimple is actually this part here. <laughs> it needs this. So this is, a, you know, this is actually just a barrette, you know, and right, right, right. it's entirely possible. I could be wrong, but um, it's just a scrunchie. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I love the fact that they incorporate it and they find a way to incorporate it by the end because, and a reason to have it be there, you know? It's, you know, it's like when, when Hela gets her big helmet, you know, when Loki has his big helmet, you know, you understand why they're, they they're have... like fans cosplaying at that point. Mm -hmm. Like it's that. And enjoyable. that's the thing at this point, Elizabeth Olsen is a fan, right? You know, like I say, you know, the real thing that Marvel does right is they get people, they either get people who are fans or they convince, or they find people who are interested in becoming fans, because by the end of it, you know, all these people are reading the comics and they're all talking about it in terms of, oh, you know, I love this story that we did. Can we look at how can we have Falcon do this and how can this happen? You know. Yeah. And when we get to Falcon and Winter Soldier, there's so much to unpack on that show, but we'll get to that mm. next. Um, Oh, do you have any anything else you want to talk about with this episode, Maz? Any final thoughts? No, I mean, I didn't, I didn't really glean too much new information, but for me, it was just kind of nice to see uh, the actors relating to each other and how much care they put into the show. And um, that, that was the, the most enjoyable part for me. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, it was just, um, it was a beautiful story told. And it was just, like I said, it was how how they assembled it, how all these pieces fit together. And honestly, now, as, as with so many other things, I'm so excited to see the next one. You know, not only because I love these stories, but I love to see how they got put together. How, you know, this is like, this is just nerd candy now. This and is like seems, my... And it seems like, especially after seeing the first episode of Falcon and Winter Soldier, that... Um, WandaVision sort of kicked off like uh, our beginning of exposition about what coming back from the blip has done to the world and exactly. the, the shattering after effects of everything. And we're, we're going to get to see a lot more of that. It seems like that's where we're heading. Oh yeah. And well, because it makes sense when you think about it, that, you know, you, you have like, in a way it kind of even makes sense that now they actually are in chronological order because this takes, WandaVision takes place a few weeks after the blip. Um, Falcon Winter Soldier takes place a few months after the blip. And it's just that idea that, yeah, you know, we are definitely, you know, this is what happens when the world changes. And this is how you have to deal with it. And, you know, sometimes you find out that in your absence, people have been doing things you're not too happy about, as Wanda found. And, right. and the, the idea of, of the supply chain of resources being devastated so drastically and then learning to cope with it over five years to feed, you know, uh, four billion people. And then all of a sudden that system that's standing on, you know, like uh, peg legs holding little things up gets taxed doubly so. Oh, yeah. And, and how do we deal with that? Oh, I mean, yeah, that's, no. And I, legal... I hope we get a deeper exploration of all those ideas because yeah, that's I mean... a fascinating sociological sort of thing to think about. Not, I, I think that'll be really interesting if we get a whole lot more uh, explanation and exposition. I will regard. say this, not since Teen Titans Go has applying for a small business loan been so engaging. <laughs> um, yeah. Teen Titans Go does a lot of educational episodes about like you know huh. real estate but but just yeah but that's when we get to falcon winter soldier which we'll get to in a few minutes you know well we'll get to it in a few minutes we'll get to it in about a week but um yeah uh it's it's it, i mean where we're going next with this is going to be interesting and beautiful and like i said i really i really feel that there is a reason these stories are dominating right now because I do think they are these real human stories that seem to be really able to understand the world and write about what the world is going to be and is even as things are moving through. Like it, it always seems prescient, but it's really like, no, we just write about, you know, what would be the ridiculous version of what we're going through now. And then of course, 
our world is so ridiculous now that eventually we catch up with the, with the, uh, right. the right. it's like, oh, wow, quarantines and stay, you know, it, it's interesting how it all works out. But anyway, um, okay, Maz, you know, uh, I hope you've been able to enjoy this show. Indeed. I hope that our listeners have been able to enjoy this show. Now, I know a lot of our listeners, like me, you know, you just go to that dollar store, get those dollar store headphones, because what do you need more than just a dollar store headphone to listen to a thing? You just keep on replacing it and replacing it and replacing it because it's only a buck. But when you think about it, by the end of the year, you've spent, you know, depending on how many times you had to buy new headphones, you might have just done better ahead getting a good set of quality headphones that are going to last you four or five years for half the price of what you're going to spend in that time. And if you go to tweakedaudio.com, you can do that and use the coupon code Southgate to get a discount on what you're buying. So that seems like a pretty practical idea from my perspective. Likewise, uh, you can use that same coupon code if you like deals, which most people do. You can go over to huntakiller.com, use that coupon code Southgate upon checkout and get a discount on the Hunt Killer product, which is essentially a bunch of puzzles and clues delivered to your house to help you solve a cold case for Michelle Gray. If you were someone who watched WandaVision and liked to connect the dots and think, what could it mean? What does it mean? Why are they hexagons? That's the game for you because you're going to get those delivered to you and you're not going to have Marvel Comics to fall back on to help you figure it out. You're going to have to use your own wits and, and cleverness from what's given in the package to solve the cold case. And if that does or doesn't interest you, you can always go down to our show notes, click on Amazon, our Amazon.com link, go to Amazon.com, buy whatever the heck you want. I don't care. It's not really my business. And uh, But by clicking on the link in our show notes, it helps out the show. And when you're there, <clears throat> check out Pod Life, the book, a uh, book written by the Southgate Media Crew about being a Southgate Media Crew podcaster. And that's available in both the digital book that is so convenient, and of course the hard copy that you want to keep in your apocalypse bunker for the coming days. When the internet goes down, you know. Gotta plan ahead, Moz. Always plan ahead, right. just like Marvel. Yeah, okay. Let's, the internet is gone. Let's read about a dead medium. <laughs> well, you know, hey, we read about we read about uh, <laughs> it'd be history. It'd be, it'd be history. Right now, you know? This yeah. is how people got by, uh, you know, uh, treating their existential dread by podcasting. Yes, back well, in the day was, when the internet was around. As it a podcaster, I will say it works. It works great. Um, anyway, Maz, if anyone does that, if they want to talk about why you podcast, how can they find you? Well, they can email me at mozmanzor at gmail.com or find me on Facebook under Moz Manzor. That's M-O-Z-Z-M-A-N-Z-O-O-R. And, of course, you can always write to me in that old-fashioned email way that we are Moz and Paz once did at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word, at gmail.com. Of course, follow me on Twitter as I live tweet no longer. DuckTales, a woohoo. Oh. Although, please... Go back, watch that final episode, friends. All your answers are there. And then so many more questions. Um, I love DuckTales, man. That was just such a great mm, chef's kiss of storytelling. Uh, <laughs> but I will be live reading something soon. I just have to find it probably Stargirl when it comes back. Because I did really like Stargirl. And very few of the other WB shows are really hitting me yet. Superman and Lois is pretty good. Batwoman is... Okay, um, but um, eh, you know, kind of <laughs> lost its thread. Honestly, it was better. They, they, the show doesn't have a Bullock, and how you do a story in Gotham without Bullock, I don't even know at this point. So, that is my opinion. There's no Bullock, no Commissioner Gordon. I don't even know what you're doing in Gotham at that point, you know. But that's just me. Bullock makes everything better. Okay, but if you would like to follow me on the Twitters, I do live tweet things at Charlie Esser. Oh, wait, oh, I did this. Yeah, so at Charlie Esser, that's C H A R L I E E S S E R. Look for the two E's in the middle. For quality. Bing. Thank you, Moz. And hey, Marvel, give me a show to podcast. Or to not to podcast, to live tweet. I would love that. So 
put one on ABCs. Now go back and watch that because I have I love to do that. So anyway, thank you. Uh, okay. Um, once again, you have come through the darkness of the day, listening to the dulcet tones of Nuff said. And so we say good night. Enough said. Uh, all right, you filthy landlubber chef, come along one more time on our grand seafaring, spacefaring, streamfaring adventure. Come back again next week as we once again sail full stream ahead. Arr. Okay. All right. um, let's save this. Yep. And then we'll do the next one and you'll send me the link. You got it. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I'm just going to go make a, a quick espresso and I yes, will be right free. back. Just give me a moment.